I want to give you an image from someone I worked with. This was an individual, the father, was a very strong, strong-willed man, very big, who had a son who was constantly failing. The mother was a gentle woman. And now they were very far apart in their parenting techniques. Now one of the things I wanted to do with this uh, father was to make him into a totally positive parent as best I could. And we had made a lot of training, we did a lot of things, and finally one day it began to dawn on him what to do. And at report card time, he achieved what I call the master of being a positive parent. He looked at his son's report card, his ninth grade son, and there were several Fs and one C in history. And this particular father told his son, I'm glad you had a C in history, turned the report card over to his son and walked out. This was very unusual because usually the kid got lots of lectures and groundings and punishments and all kinds of things on report cards like that. Later on when the child approached the father about the bad grades he had made because the kid couldn't understand why his father wasn't doing all these negative things to him anymore, the father looked at him and said, well son, I see those bad grades. They're, they are F's there, yes, but they're high F's. I mean, it takes some learning to make a 65 in math and a 58 in English. Now the son was so bothered and flam floxed by his father's positive approach that he didn't quite know how to do anything after that except start working more. Now we used some of the 10-step program, but here's what changed. And this is the important part. When our children have emotional blocks and motivational blocks to change, they're always better if they talk to us about them. In other words, if they are communicating their hearts and minds to us, then they are more likely to change than if we just use some power techniques against them. And that's the secret. Let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest with yourself. If you weren't doing very well because you had some emotional blocks and some feelings that were very uncomfortable for you, would you want to talk to someone about that who is angry, upset, and demanding and might be kind of sour to you if you started to confess your deepest thoughts and feelings, the ones you were most afraid of? You wouldn't even talk to that person. Are you the parent your child cannot talk to because of your emotional reactions, your anger, and your being upset. That's what we need to change. Because as your children go through the 10 steps, they're going to open up to you. They're going to tell you things about themselves that you don't know. When parents talk to me about their children, they'll tell me, well, Johnny thinks this, and Johnny feels this way, and Johnny's motivated this way. And I ask them, how do you know? and they start pointing to behavior. The behavior can be caused by anything. A bad grade can be caused by, well, we know six different types of underachievers that have complex motivational patterns. Each one create bad grades. So we need to get to the core. And we get to the core, you're going to learn so much information about your child that you're going to be surprised. But they, they, if they never tell you, if they never talk to you, you're not going to know and the techniques won't work as well. And that's why you become a positive parent. You change the emotional nature of that relationship from being negative to being positive. Now your child may not change readily. Your child's still going to expect you to be negative. Your child's going to expect you to be confrontational. Your child's going to expect all kinds of things that you're no longer doing. But if you remain steady, eventually they'll start changing and opening up to you. And that's the key to being a totally positive parent and why it's necessary. Because the techniques you're going to learn are powerful enough to open up to communication. And now that I've mentioned that word communication, you need to understand something about communication. And I'm going to explain it to you in common ordinary terms. You don't need to go out and take a whole uh, college course or seminar on communication. You'll get it all right here. There's four levels. Level one is cliche. It's the level of cliche. You know. How, how do you do today? How are you? Fine. And you're not fine. Uh, you, your car broke down. Um, your, uh, your grandmother's sick. And the IRS is going to audit your account. And your friend says, how are you? And you say, fine. It's just cliche. It has no real meaning. It's just social. 
most communications that teenagers give each other, and sometimes parents, are the same variety. How was school today? Fine. Do you have any homework? Nah, I did it all at school. What did you learn? Nothing. You get no communication. There's another level, level two. We definitely do not want level one. Level two is just the facts. Just exactly what happened and, and, and what happened and how it happened and what, are you, what was studied, what was homework. And at that level, most parents of underachievers don't get the facts until the school reports it. But we definitely want facts and we'll, I'll teach you how to do that. But there's another level below the facts. And this is where we begin to really alter the underachievement pattern when we get to level three. As we're getting more into the heart and mind of the child. We're getting into their thoughts. Not the fleeting thoughts, but the core level thoughts. What they really see, what they think, what they perceive, what their hopes, what their dreams are. How they feel about the facts. How they feel about you. Their emotional states, their motivations, their intentions. That's the level we want to be we want to get down to that level three. But the most creative level of communication is as teenagers we hardly ever get to without really working at it and that's the level of open-hearted talk. Now we know you have to, it's hard to define what an open-hearted communication is but you know it when you're there because there's, there's you don't even know who's leading the response. It's just one response to another and the other responds back to you. And that's the open-hearted communication. It's very creative. And here's the interesting thing that happens. When parents and children can reach that open-hearted communication at least every once in a while, kids f feel deeply emotionally connected to you and vice versa, you to them. And yet they feel separate and independent at the same time, which is the what all adolescents want. They want to feel connected with somebody and independent. Now, since independence is a real problem and underachievement, when you uh, get down to level three and four in your communication with your teenager, especially about school problems in the future, you are automatically where you need to be to train them to be fully independent people. They no longer feel if I tell mom and dad things, they're going to take control of me. That's a very important level to be. So when we go through the 10-step program, when you're talking to your child, I want you to be categorizing in your mind, wow, what level are we on? Because level three may not be totally creative. It's more creative, certainly, than level two. But when you reach level four, you're going to know it. It's like being in love. You don't know how to define it, but you know when you're, when you're in love. But that's what it's going to be because the love and the care and the concern will flow between you and your child. And it's easier than for the child to feel I can solve problems. You know, in essence, what we do as parents from the very beginning, we surround our children with love. We love them. We provide them with a loving world so they can feel connected. And they go out into the real world where it's not so much love and they can do better. And they come back and reconnect. When they get to be teenagers, they're trying to get away from all that, but they still need us. And as parents, even with uh, the stubborn, sort of rebellious teenager, we are still the most powerful influences in their lives, or we can be if we can reach their hearts. And that's what these techniques that we're going to discuss are really designed to do among not just getting behavior change. What we're trying to do is change the heartfelt, emotional destiny of our kids, help them achieve but feel good and connected with us at the same time. Kids who grow through the teenage years connected with parents do much better. And if you have an underachiever, you know you're not connected because you can rarely get the facts. Now one, one aspect of communication I want you to understand. Many parents have told me that their kids tell them all this stuff about the peer group. Do not, do not confuse gossip with real communication. Gossip is at the level of cliché. It's at the level of, well, I'm talking about other people. What you always want to get the child back to is self-reflection, introspection, and communication at the deeper levels with you. Their I statements, their self statements the child makes. I feel this way. This is how I see things. This is what I experience. This is what I feel. This is what I want. These are the things that move me.
when we're talking about communication, we need to talk about one more thing. We need to talk about listening and how to ask good questions. You see, you become a little bit more passive as time goes on with this program, and your youngster has to become more active. You become less problem-solving, and then your child becomes more problem-solving. Isn't that, well, won't that be nice? But the first thing, sort of the, the setup skills for the 10-step program is listening. Now, the listening is very different than what most people think. I want you to become a very curious listener. For example, if your child says the reason why he fails history is I am bored, I want you to be very curious about that feeling of being bored. Don't think that just because you know what boredom is for you, then that must be what your child means. I want you to ask good questions like, um, what is boredom like for you? How often does it happen? Does it happen in all these different areas? You'll find, by the way, when you explore your child's experiences of boredom, at least my experience is most children are really meaning anger and resentment. Sometimes they describe sort of depressive sort of feelings. Rarely do they describe what most people would consider to be boredom. Sometimes they say, I just don't like it. That's what boredom means. But that gives you more information. If a child says he forgot, I want you to be curious about how that forgetting occurs. When it occurred, how it occurred, how often does it occur, does it occur in other areas of life as well. I want you to explore those problems. In order to do that, probably the best skill to develop is something for those of you who took philosophy in college is called the Socratic Dialogue Method. Now, if you know anything about Socrates, he always asked good questions and the people he was asking good questions to had to give more and more and more and more answers and the more and more and more answers they gave, the more they hung themselves. And that's what we want with kids. We'll find all their little problems and make them have some insight and change when we ask good questions. But in case you didn't take that philosophy course in college, let me give you another image. You may have seen a TV program called Columbo. Remember the detective? The crumpled suit, the little cigar, and he always asked the next irritating detailed question. That's who you become. So I want that mental image in your head of being a good Columbo type person. Now, the next situation, the next technique I want you to learn before we get into the others is something called a sequence analysis. Boy, that sounds technical, doesn't it? A sequence analysis, however, is nothing more than finding the excuse and beginning to unhook them. Let me explain what a sequence analysis is. It's simply how something occurred. Now, please don't ask the question why something occurred, why they forgot, why they didn't do something, because most kids will look at, look at you and go, I don't know. And that's the end of your inquiry, right? Well, there's special things you can do with the I don't know response, but it's a stopper most of the time. But how did it happen? Ask for behavioral sequences. And let me give you an example of what I mean. It's very simple. A child says to you, your child says to you, uh, I forgot my homework assignment. I forgot to do it, so I didn't turn it in. Oh, okay. Well, how did that happen? And they'll say, I don't know. Say, well, no, literally. Did you, um, what happened when you got home from school? And what you want is a sequence of what they did and what they were thinking. So, and this is a real life example. The child walks in, puts his books on the um, table, and he remembers he had an English assignment because he said, I remembered. What did you do next? Well, I went and had a snack. That's all you do now as a parent. Well, what happened next? Well, after the snack, I went into the living room and watched some TV. Did you think about your homework? Oh, yeah, I thought about it right after the snack, but I went and watched TV. Well, then what happened? Well, I had supper. Well, then what happened? Well, I was going to sit down to do my English, but the phone rang. And it's a bunch of friends, and we had this long conversation. And uh, I kept thinking, well, I'll just get to my English later. And, well, it got late, and so I did some math. And I thought, I need to do my English, but it was so late, I thought, oh, I'll just do it in the morning. I woke up late in the morning and I forgot to do my English and got to school and I remembered that I had to have it done and I tried to do it during history but the teacher got on me so I didn't get my work done. I forgot. Well now if you have a sequence analysis like that, what have you just discovered as a parent? 
forgetting did not occur. The fact is that every time your child remembered, he did something else. He made a decision, but you can see in his mind he's not understanding his, that he had a decision to make. It just something happened and he went and did something else. So if you do a good sequence analysis, and you're going to need that skill, you will be able to capture those moments when your child makes decisions and make a good intervention and asking good questions that we're going to learn about in the 10-step program, how it works. But you will now have a tool for really helping your children learn to change. And what have you done? You sat back in a nice, quiet, patient manner, became a good, curious person, and your children were trapped. You've trapped them into a decision. And now what are they going to do next time? And that's a good question. Well, now that you have heard uh, all the preliminaries, what we need to do now is get down to some basic uh, techniques in terms of change. But I need, I need to say one thing to you. When you hear the techniques that we're going to do, when you hear this material, I'm going to want you to understand that it's going to sound somewhat simple, but, it, but every technique that I teach you is going to have multiple levels of change built in. They're going to, be, they're going to, have, they're going to do more than one thing at once. Now, the first thing I'm going to teach you is what I call supplementary disciplines. Then we're going to do the 10 steps. Now, the supplementary disciplines you use depending upon the problem. I would not recommend necessarily beginning totally with them, um, but I want you to understand them first because we'll surround the 10 steps with these supplementary techniques. What you need to learn now is the specific of, uh, steps of the 10-step program. There are two aspects to this. One are called supplementary disciplines that surround it, and then there's the, the beautiful part of the 10-step program itself. I'm going to discuss the preliminary kind of uh, supplementary disciplines first so that you can use them as you need them. Now, the first preliminary uh, discipline or supplementary discipline is called establishing the value of honesty and truth in reporting uh, school subjects to you. Now, the first thing that kids are going to want to do is make school a privacy issue. It's my school, or if you'll just leave me alone, I'll do it. None of which, of course, works, but let me tell you, let's straighten this out right at the beginning. School is not a privacy issue. It is performance. It is the same thing if you go to work and your boss wants to know how you're performing, you hide it from him and lie, you're not going to work there very often, right? You'll be fired eventually. Same deal with schoolwork, except that you want to train your child to be honest with you. So that's how you set it up. You sit down with them and you begin a discussion establishing honesty as the way to proceed. For example, you'd sit down with your child and just uh, bring up the idea, Johnny, uh, how do you feel about the truth? How do you feel about telling me the truth about things? I think honesty is a pretty good uh, policy in a, between you and me. Now, most kids, if you do it in an offhanded way, if you just set up a little talk, kind of a special moment, say, now I need to talk to you about something, They'll agree that honesty is a basic value because you rear them and they have your values. Then you hit them with the idea this is going to be about school. And you tell them that what you want to do is help them achieve better results in school. You want to help them uh, learn to enjoy it, to feel good about school, to connect good feelings with it, and to get a lot out of it. But the first thing that you're going to need to help them is the facts. You're going to need the facts of the situation, what he's doing and not doing, but you are going to do this with him. You're going to set up a kind of a contract or a bargain. He's going to tell you the good and the bad and the ugly about the facts of school, and you're not going to respond the old way. You're not going to punish, ground, lecture, reward, bribe, or any of those things. You're going to listen, record information, and that's all you're going to do at first. Okay, now there's six questions that we use. You know, and you do these on a daily basis. And here are the six questions. And he's supposed to give you the honest answer. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, well, Dr. Whitley, uh, my kids lied to me in the past about schoolwork. That's fine. We're going to deal with that. 
But the first thing you establish is these six questions. So let's talk about them. Question number one, you're going to ask him on a daily basis, uh, what have you studied today in school? You're going to ask about each class. I simply want you to write down. Now, I don't want a lot of details about what he's studying. I don't want you to do that. If he says, well, we're studying the Battle of Concord in the Revolutionary War, fine. That's, that's all you need. That primes his memory pump about what he's been doing in school. That's actually a study technique, by the way. For A students sit down and do that all the time. They think, well, what did I do in school today? What did I do in history? They're actually rehearsing a little bit and priming the memory pump for what else they have to do. The second question is, do you have any homework due tomorrow? And that's with each class again, history, math, science. All you're trying to do is get information. Now he's going to think, or she's going to think, you're going to make them do the work. So you want to establish that you're not going to force them to do homework. All you want to know is do they have it? The second, the, I mean the third question is are there any long-term projects that you have to do? Long-term project means something that's due anywhere between two and three days to two or three weeks. It takes more than one night to do it. Are there, the fourth question, are there any tests that have been announced? Are there any tests coming up? Now the supplement to this is if they say yes, there is a test that's going to be Friday. The supplementary question is what kind of grade do you want to make on that test? And you just note it. The fifth question, did you turn all your work in today? There's no missing work, no incomplete work, is it all in? So there'd be no zeros. And finally the sixth question is, do you get any grades back? Do you want to know the grades they got back that day? That's all we need to know. Those are six questions and then you're finished.